So before I kind of start moving things around and show the sped up footage, I just wanted to kind of note that I switched out the model. Um, basically, I talked to my client and we kind of both agreed that we wanted more of a voluptuous kind of curvy woman because we thought it would be very cool like if she was very muscular and if she was super curvy and a bit more plus sized um so yeah just if you were wondering like why she's changed that's the reason but yeah enjoy the sped up footage and after i'm kind of done moving things around i'm gonna talk about why i made those specific choices and yeah so see you in a bit
All right, so I think this is the final placement of all of the assets. So one thing I had in mind when I was placing everything around the scene is that I kind of wanted to have these bigger surfaces here towards the front because I want to give the impression that this is closer to us and the further away you get, the smaller surfaces you get, but not too small that it would kind of create visual noise and be too distracting because obviously we want most of our detail to be here in the front and not in the background. So when I do eventually start my paint over, I'm going to knock back a lot of these surfaces and kind of merge a lot of things together. But before then, like right now, I think it works. Uh, eventually, when we add in our hatch, this area might not work. So we might have to either get rid of that or add in some more rocks. We'll eventually get there. So <laughs> as you probably saw, I opened a window here. And if you don't know how to do that, you basically just go to a corner. So if you go to like any corner here, you should get a plus sign. There we go. And you can either drag one to the side or as I did, I dragged one up. So I always have this extra window down here. So if I want to kind of enter shader mode, for example, I can go to shader editor, press whatever asset and I have that ready down here, but I can also collapse it if I just want to kind of see this view. Um, but yeah, for the 3D view, um, I, I find it easier to kind of have a more zoomed out version of this. It kind of works as a thumbnail almost. So if it reads well as a thumbnail, then you know you're on the right path. But basically I just kind of had this open and then just started moving things around till I kind of found something that looked good. And if I enter full screen mode, which is control spacebar, by the way, if you didn't know that, I think I'm happy with this. I think I eventually want to add footprints down here to kind of show that she's been climbing. That's why I kind of wanted to create this like spiral effect almost. I might reinforce this when I start my paint over, but again, let's not get ahead of ourselves. I think the next thing to tackle is probably lighting. So if I press control spacebar again to get everything up, and let's open this up, go to my add-on. Actually, what I'm gonna do is drop this down. Um, let's actually try just moving the azimuth around to kind of see if we find something better because I actually really liked having half her face in darkness. I thought that would look pretty cool. So let's see if we can kind of make that a bit more dramatic. Let's just turn it. Oh, actually this looks pretty dramatic. Oh, I kind of like how it's like hitting her head actually. That looks really cool. Actually, that isn't too bad. Let's try the elevation. So let's try making that. Yeah, it's gonna brighten everything up. And as you see, it's not compressing the background as much. So I'm actually not gonna be doing that. Um, but right now, I actually sort of like what's going on here with the lighting because the lighting is kind of creating almost a rim light effect on her and that's making her pop out against the background, which is really good, which is actually exactly what we want. Not too sure if I'm happy with what's happening here because ideally I would want a bit more shadow here so that the biggest contrast will be on her. So actually, let's bring this up again. Yeah, as a thumbnail, you can kind of see that it reads like her shape, her silhouette just reads much better. So let's actually try adding in a plane. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, if you want to make sure that you don't like accidentally select like the fog and everything, you can hook this off. Um, then anything like the fog and everything can't be selected. So if you hook that on, anything within that folder can now be selected. So actually let's try to figure out where the sun is coming from so it's coming from top and behind so if i what we can actually do is make this transparent so if we go to the shader new transparent 
Let's see if this works. Um, alpha blend. And just make sure that we have opaque on, on the shadow mode. Now it will be invisible in our view, but it will cast shadows. So this is actually a really good way of kind of creating artificial shadows, um, because sometimes you want things to be in shadow and you don't always want everything to be simulated by lighting. You kind of want to art direct the lighting. If you go into the render passes and you choose shadow, you'll see that everything will be either in light or in dark. And I actually made a video about that. So if you want to kind of check that out in further detail, I highly recommend it. But right now, if we just see this as our thumbnail, what I can actually do is start moving things around. And yeah, as you can see, like some of this is getting covered in darkness now, which is good. So let's actually scale that up. But yeah, now we're losing her. So we need to make sure that she isn't being lost. I obviously want her hand, her arm to be popping out. So it would be good to kind of have that contrasted against some of these shapes. And I also want some of the rope to kind of read against the fog. So let's see if we keep moving this around. I kind of like what's happening there. And we can obviously uh, duplicate this. So we can Alt D duplicate it and just try moving it. We can actually make it a bit smaller maybe. Okay, as a silhouette, this is reading right. Her body is being a bit lost, but what happens if we turn on our combined again? Hmm, interesting. Okay, what if we up the intensity of the lamp? I'm actually gonna bring up my reference and kind of have that there. Okay, yeah, the blue is a bit too blue, so let's actually bring the saturation down or maybe make this a bit more greenish blue okay so let's see if we can actually make the intensity of the lamp a bit higher but now this is being blown out so what we actually have to do is we have to go to the render properties here and kind of turn down the bloom a bit so Maybe the radius or maybe the intensity. Bring that down to 0.5. And let's bring that to 5. Threshold to, let's see, 5. And let's see if this one actually has a shader on it. Nope. Let's add in a shader. And for the volume settings, let's maybe brighten this up a bit. So actually with the rocks, I think we should brighten up a bit more because right now they're very dark. So let's go to each individual rock. So I think I'm pretty happy with where it is right now. I think once we have more of the basic shapes kind of blocked out, like the clothing, the hair, and some of the ancient hatch elements, we can obviously adjust the lighting a bit more, kind of move some things around if they're too distracting or if it just doesn't look good or it's creating tangents. Um, but right now I was actually thinking I had an idea of having these kind of talismans, which is inspired by Ofudas, which are basically these paper talisman that kind of works as like the symbol of a shrine's deity. And I was thinking for this ancient hatch that maybe because I want to convey danger and action that this hatch isn't supposed to be messed with. So maybe having some of these like talismans kind of like hanging off of it and kind of flying in the wind, I think that would actually look really cool. As for the Viking woman, uh, I did a bit of research. I tried to kind of find some costume examples and tried to kind of find a visual direction for the Viking. 
I know I want her to come across as very badass, uh, but the thing is, since she's wearing a lot of white paint uh, that protects her against the winter cold, I don't want her to be very covered up and the typical Viking concept art that you see is like super bulky and lots of fur and it's kind of covering most of the body, or not most of the body, but a lot of the body. So I tried to find some concept art that's kind of like a middle ground between that. I know I kind of want her to have this kind of wild look about her. The color scheme itself is going to be pretty neutral. So I think I'm mostly going to be going with like reds and oranges and browns and kind of white neutral colors because I want the red paint on her face to be really standing out. I'm thinking of maybe even making it as thick as this and maybe having a few like symbols. And as for the hair, I am debating having it a mix between something like this and maybe some braids like this. I don't know, I just was really drawn to this kind of look. I think it looks very unique because most of what you see for badass Viking women is like this kind of look or this. Um, so yeah, I might actually go for something like this mixed with a lot of maybe like bones and dreads and stuff like that. I also really like the kind of symbols that's going on here, like a lot of tattoos. I think one of the women here, yeah, here we go, has like a lot of tattoos. I think if we have that red paint contrasted against the white skin, I think that could look really cool. As for this concept, I, I thought it was very interesting that she had a lot of kind of like skin exposed. She doesn't scream Viking as much as I would like, so I think I might be inspired by this image, but try to mix in some of the elements here. I really like the silhouette of kind of having this coat kind of tie around her waist, having her arms exposed because she's very muscular, she's very strong, so we should definitely show that off and maybe having her legs exposed as well. So yeah, like a mix between all of these different concepts. I also really like this kind of look, but I think it screams a bit more barbarian than it does Viking. So it's kind of like a fine line to walk. So you need to like kind of balance a lot of these things. What I actually kind of usually do with these kind of characters in Blender, instead of kind of sculpting everything and hand modeling everything, I often just kind of block things out super quickly with just primitives to kind of gain an idea and maybe add in a few like talismans and things kind of hanging off here. I know that maybe I want to add some of this fabric hanging off of her so we can kind of flow in the wind as well because I think that would look very dynamic. We want to kind of convey action and adventure and one way of doing that is having like fabric kind of flow in the wind. I was actually thinking of adding some like snow effects to kind of make this seem like this is like quite the trip to make just to kind of reach this ancient hatch. But yeah, I am actually just gonna, because I kind of find it hard to kind of think and talk and work at the same time. So I'm actually gonna just try to block out these really rough shapes. And then I'm gonna just pause things and kind of show you what I've been doing, what I'm thinking, um, how I kind of want to move forward. So yeah, see you in a bit. Psych! <laughs> so what I actually ended up doing was just recording the entire process and leaving it to future Christina to talk over. So hello, I am Christina from the future. <laughs> What I tend to do with both clothing and hair is to block out things roughly with primitives. In this case, I knew I wanted a sort of faux hawk style for her hair, as well as dreads, so I used a plane, merged all vertices to one vertice with M, and I added a skin and subdivision modifier to just block out the volume of the hair. Note that I have my reference up on the screen to know how far down on the forehead this hair should go and how it generally just kind of shapes around the skull. The benefit of using the skin modifier is that it generally just feels more organic and is great for blocking out more organic shapes. You basically just extrude points, scale them up, and the best thing is that this is completely editable, so you never need to commit 100% to the shape. You can always change the shape later on. What you can also do is duplicate these shapes while in edit mode and just block out different sections of the hair at the top. I scaled down the tips and added in lots of hair strands for reference. 
I'll be painting over all of this later on, but I wanted a rough block out in order to get some light information and just see how the light hits the hair and how it casts shadows. Next I created some head accessories using bezier curves and the bezier circles, just trying to kind of match the reference in my pure ref mood board. I then duplicated one of the circles and basically used that circle to block out the ropes that were supposed to wrap around the corset. I felt like this was a great opportunity to add some dynamic movement to the illustration, so I thought I could make some rope kind of fly in the wind in the same direction of the hair essentially. Next, to block out the dress, I used a plane and added in a shrink wrap modifier. What that basically does is snap the planes to the closest surface of a reference mesh. Alright, so using this example model, I'm just going to show how I usually go about creating clothing or armor or straps and stuff like that. If you now just have your model ready and you shift A, add in a plane. Let's just shrink that. Alright, so if you want to kind of snap something to another surface, the best way to go about that is to kind of use this snapping tool. And you also have a few options here. You can snap it to a vertex, to an edge, face. Usually I choose face, and if you enable it and now press G, it's going to snap it to the nearest face you have selected. I kind of like having this off, and if you start moving it and hit control, it's going to kind of turn that on, but you don't have to have it on all the time. So actually let's scale this down and try it out. So move with G and snap it. And now I'm going to use the shrink wrap modifier because if we now start extruding, it's not going to kind of snap to the surface of the model. So if I choose the shrink wrap and I'm going to select my model as a reference, you can see that it's kind of snapped to the surface. And if we now use the offset option, Obviously, because it's just one poly, it's going to be a bit difficult. So if I scale it down, it's going to conform a bit better. But what if we enter edit mode? And what if we now select an edge and hit E? Just pay attention to what's happening. Can you see that it's like conforming to the model now? And if I now select all of these and hit E again, it's going to continue doing that. But obviously, you can see uh, you get a bit of glitching here. So let's actually select each individual point. actually try to turn that off so if you turn off this you'll see how the original mesh actually looks like so let's try to get that a bit closer so yeah for some reason I had the offset kind of set to minus um, but if you just set it in a positive direction it's going to project outwards and you can see it's now conforming better to our model so if I now choose some of the points and I press this little button again and just press E. You can see it continues to conform to the model. Just be careful because when you get to something very close, like you see the arm is going to start snapping to that surface of the forearm. So that's just something to kind of be aware of. But you can see how this is very useful for creating clothing or armor. And if you find that this is too low poly and things aren't looking quite nice or they're not snapping correctly, uh, I would advise to maybe add a subdivision surface because as you can see now, it just looks a lot nicer. And another great tool uh, I would advise you to use is proportional editing. So if you kind of just hide everything and you just start, oh, let's make that smaller. And you see you can kind of flexibly choose points and start moving them around. So you can kind of move that up. Let's move this further around her arm. Just make sure it's not snapping to the back. But yeah, this is a great way to kind of create skin tight stuff. So if you have, for example, a swimming suit or straps or bandages and stuff like that. So you'll see me kind of use this method for the bandages later on. But I thought I'd kind of slow down the video and just explain my process. This is just such a useful tool. I love using the shrink wrap modifier.
Just ignore that big blob on her shoulder. I was basically thinking of adding a fur pelt there, but I ended up just scrapping that whole idea. As you can see, I added a solidify modifier to give the cloth a bit of thickness and use proportional editing, which is this little icon as I mentioned earlier, to move bigger chunks of the vertices around. I was trying to just find a nice way to wrap this dress around her and also tried avoiding hiding her figure too much. Since she's already in sort of a crouched position with her torso, I didn't just want to add more bulk to her. I still kind of wanted her to come across as feminine and not just like hide everything away. Here I actually copied some of the faces and pressed P to separate them. This makes it so that you still keep the modifiers on of the previous mesh, but you get a completely separate mesh to play around with. Since I'm only interested in things looking good from the front, it really doesn't matter if things are disconnected in the back. I made sure to have my thumbnail in the viewport at the bottom so I could keep tabs on how the cloth looks from that angle. To match the rope and the hair, it made sense to also have this cloth flapping in the wind as well. Her necklace armor thing was basically created from a cylinder without caps. To add more flexibility, I just added a subdivision modifier and used proportional editing to get it looking alright. Since this is just going to be a still image, I only needed to fill out whatever will be in the shot, so as you can see, I didn't make an effort to make the clothing wrap around the entire back. I won't be selling this model, I just need something that looks good from the front. This whole workflow totally reminds me of the Simpson meme, you know what I'm talking about, it's, it's so true though. <laughs> Anyway, similarly to the hair and the ropes, I extended the dress and gave it a nice shape to kind of indicate that that too was blowing in the wind, just like the back portion. In the end, I ended up brightening this part, as you can see in the final result, and that just like really helped push the idea of death in this image. The brooch, pauldron, and straps were all made the same way. They were essentially just a plane with a subdivision and solidify modifier on. In edit mode, you just get so much flexibility moving these shapes around and you can easily extrude points, make the surfaces more curved and so on. I actually copied one of these faces and separated them to create the shirt as well, but also used a shrink wrap modifier on top to make the shape conform to her chest. This method is just so incredibly quick and efficient. As a general rule, I advise to keep these blockouts fairly low poly to allow for more flexibility. Once you're done with the big shape, you can always throw on a subdivision modifier on top, like I showed earlier in the demonstration. This is where you'll clearly see how impatient and scatterbrained I tend to be when working on illustrations. I wasn't finished with the outfit just yet, but decided to just block in some colors to kind of take my mind off things, like to just kind of change things up a bit. I was looking at my reference and although the color scheme worked really well with the characters there, since we have strong blues and reds in our scene, it's really all about context and it took me a good while to figure out something I liked. If I remember correctly, I actually settled on a palette here and now and then changed that later on, uh, but we'll eventually get there. Since I couldn't find a palette I really liked, I just decided to start working on the paper bits for the hatch instead. So let me just pause for a bit and I'll just show you how I did that. So if you go to shift A and you add in a curve, a bezier curve, and let's actually straighten that up. There we go. And now if you go to the curves menu, 
If you remember earlier, I was talking about using the geometry to kind of create the paper and how we use the bevel to kind of create the rope. Yeah, this time we're not going to do that. We're actually going to use extrude. And if you now go into edit mode, you see that we have different points that we can manipulate. And just like before, we can select two points, right click, subdivide, and we can scale this up. We can scale this down. We can rotate it and scale it up and so on. So this is the method I'll be using for the talisman paper thingies that hang on the hatch itself. You can see that I'm still looking at the thumbnail in the window below to make sure that the paper bits look good. I want them to seem dynamic and like they're blowing at the viewer. This just adds to the whole dynamic movement thing I've been talking about earlier. And since we'll have symbols on them, or we're going to paint them in later on, they need to be close-ish to the camera so that they're readable. Also having these paper bits kind of close to the camera just reinforces that the hatch is sort of in the foreground, it's closer to the camera than it is the Viking woman. Seeing how the Viking woman was still missing her boots and a few details, I decided to move forward with that. Again, I had my reference on the left to kind of guide me when I came to the style of the boots. Since we won't really be seeing much of the feet anyway, I didn't really spend too much time working on this part of the model and I ended up making some horribly looking boots. <laughs> so I just kind of wanted to just stop here and kind of show how to add different types of materials to the same mesh. So as you can see here, everything is joined together. So if you want to add different materials to this mesh, let's just go into material preview mode. And if we now add a texture and let's make it red. If you now want the ears to be a different material, you just enter edit mode. And let's actually select a point here on both ears. And let's just control numpad plus, just grow the selection a bit. So say we wanted this to be a completely different material. So you just go to your material library and you add a new material. And then you can change the color. But as you can see, nothing's really happening. And that's because we haven't pressed a sign. So now if you click out of that selection, say that you wanted to select this again, you just hit select. Or if you want to select the red parts, you just select the red material and press select. This is a method I used for the boots to kind of get that fur texture and to kind of get that leather texture on the same model. To keep the design coherent, I duplicated the red rope curves around the corset belt and just decided to use them on the boots and made some horrendous looking straps to go over the boots as well. Even though you won't really be seeing much of them, but eh, why not? And yay, time for some bandages! Just like I showed you in the shrink wrap tutorial bit earlier on, I used a bunch of cylinders without any caps to project them onto the skin using the shrink wrap modifier. I'm telling you, it's such a handy trick. You can enter edit mode, which will show you the original shape of the mesh. Since the mesh gets projected, it might sometimes be hard to see how the original shape is twisting. And since I'm indecisive AF, I changed the cloth color again. Getting closer to the final result though. <laughs> I just want to emphasize that this is not a modeling tutorial. The way I model things are super rough and dirty. I keep saying that in like every 3D modeling tutorial I've made. I'm really not caring about good modeling practices. My intentions with all of these 3D drafts for my illustrations is just to have a form I can cast light onto and a form I can assign a material to. What I extract from these 3D renders is basically lighting information, color information, perspective, and so on. My 3D drafts always tend to look really ugly before I start my paint over. Now, you might be completely different. You might like to spend as little time painting over it and instead polish the 3D to a really good stage. If that's your jam, all the more power to you. We each have our own process, so there's really no right and wrong. It's mostly just about the outcome, however you get there. As long as you're not like stealing work or anything like that, it really doesn't matter. 
I'm really shit at conveying my ideas through sketches, so I just find 3D to be such a convenient way of plotting an idea quickly and efficiently. And it just allows for so much flexibility as well. Don't want a daytime scene? No problem, I'll just get rid of the sunlight and make the scene dark and gloomy. With sketches, you might sometimes have to redo an entire sketch, so that's actually why I really love 3D and it's just, it's just so convenient. Ever since I transitioned from traditional 2D sketches and 2D thumbnails, I've actually gotten such a positive response from all of my clients. There's something about seeing 3D form interacting with light in a scene that just makes it easier for them to see what you have in mind. Now be careful though, I always advise for people who aren't as strong fundamentally to use 3D. Not because the 3D won't be great or anything like that, um, but if a 2D illustration is the main objective, they might not have developed the skills enough to translate what 3D gives you to a 2D illustration and they might lean too heavily on what 3D gives them instead of developing core fundamentals, which are much needed. <laughs> I won't go too much into this as I don't want to come across as preachy, but it is an important thing to keep in mind. If you're interested in hearing more about this topic, I highly recommend my first design principles video back on the Polycosm YouTube channel. So that's enough preaching for one video. <laughs> Here I use Sketchfab to import a leather pouch. Instead of custom modeling one, I just decided to get a free model instead to just kind of save a bit of time. You've seen it throughout the entire video, but I use Blender sculpting tools a lot. You don't need any extensive knowledge of sculpting, just a basic brush will do wonders. Here I finally started fleshing out secondary details, which is fluffy wool. I wanted the shoes, skirt edges and other parts to have a different type of material that kind of puffed out and that was achieved with a displacement modifier and a musgrave texture. I'm not super well versed in this technique so if you want to learn about it there are tons of displacement tutorials on YouTube. What displacement does is that it kind of adds a layer of displacement on top of the model without kind of changing the original mesh's geometry, unless you apply it of course. And the Musgrave texture is basically one of Blender's internal textures that adds noise to the displacement, making it kind of appear quote unquote blobby. <laughs> the point of this was to kind of help me gain some lighting information on how a surface like that would look in this type of environment. And we're basically finished with the 3D draft. I want to put my final touches on the scene, so I just adjust the lighting and colors as needed and decide to bring in the snow texture I mentioned a while back. Again, if you want to learn how to create layered effects like this one, check out this quick tips video back on the Polycosm channel. I made sure to make the texture bigger closer to the camera and smaller in the background. That will actually help kind of convey a better sense of depth. All right, let's go over to the process slides. We first started with a preliminary draft, just kind of blocking out everything super roughly to get an overall impression of the lighting, composition and color palette. Then we worked on blocking out the colors and figuring out the placement of all of the models. And finally we added a second layer of detail, adjusted the colors and lighting as needed and added some snow effects. So the only thing left to add now is the hatch or the vault, which I will be sculpting in 3D coat and we'll cover in the next video. Thanks so much for watching guys. Bye.